Hello, Rachel. Hello, Ryan. Are you feeling yum yum today? Uh, come on. Are you feeling yum yum today? No. What? How could you? We've learned a new language. Hey, do you want to speak in Species 10C language for the entire podcast? We learned it. Yeah. It's really great for this medium. And uh, okay, well, uh, so we are Yum Yum Podcast, and we are going to be looking over an episode of Star Trek Discovery. So for those out there wondering, yes, we're going to spoil it, and you should know already how the language of 10C go, so you'll completely understand what the next hour will be like. Okay, off off we go. Let's start talking in uh, 10C language. Imagine if I just did this for a whole hour, people. <laughs> I was tempted to just sit here for a whole hour flashing lights and uh, pheromones. You you guys could hear it, of course. You you guys all understood it. Uh, Rachel, Yum Yum was a line said by Commander Nandi, who did make an appearance this season. And as each episode passes uh, since her appearance, I, key, I ask myself, why did they bother? Mm-hmm. And yeah, valid question. Why did they bother with with any of it? Uh, so <sighs> she said a line one time. We thought it was really funny, and we named the podcast after it. And we rate things on Yum Yum, and we look at things Yum Yum related, such as moments within an episode that were so bizarre, so out of left field, so wacky. Just like when Commander Nan D said yum yum, we look at those moments and we flag them up. Was there a specific moment in uh, Species 10C that was yum yum? Licorice. Really? Anything to do with the licorice. But it had a payoff. It did, but Reno asking for the licorice... Demanding that the licorice be delivered faster. The fact that they were given licorice throughout when they're yeah. a prisoner. Uh, good choice. M- mine is the thumbnail for uh, discussion, the one where Michael and Saru scream at each other. Y- yeah, I-, I was leaving that for you. It was bad the first time, and they thought it was cute, so they brought it back. So it's a setup and a payoff. It's a little recurring thing. Will this be something that they bring throughout the whole entire show? Like how in Farscape, John and Dargo do their rock, paper, scissors. Will Saru and burn him just scream at each other oh that would be wonderful i would very much like that in high tension situations on the bridge they just start screaming and then everyone does it and 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 it's supposed to be like this beautiful cathartic thing the music swells but all you're seeing is these actors doing a little squat motion as they go ah! the little the little squat is important. That is important. You can't do it without the little squad. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, like it's not like him getting down to her level. Mm-hmm. It's like mm-hmm. we must squat to scream. That's it's the two S's. Squat scream. That's the SS. Uh, not the German SS, of course. That's a that's a whole entire different thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, don't be. As the DMA approaches Earth and Navarre, Captain Burnham and the crew of the USS Discovery attempt to make first contact with the powerful species responsible before it's too late. And this is episode 12? Yeah. Or 13? Yeah. What's the rating on IMDb? Currently, it is a whopping 6.5. With under 2,000 ratings. It is the highest rated episode of season four of Star Trek Discovery, according to IMDb. Uh, I just wanted to make that known. Uh, I think I was actually supposed to read that description, but I I forgot what (laughs) number we were up to. And people, just imagine that I read it and that I read the, the next week one. 
Uh, so, uh, I, history relationship-wise with this, I, I have memories of the encounter with the species 10C. They break through, they start communicating with them, and problems ensue. Book and Tarka shenanigans come to their boiling point, and wouldn't you know it, the villain that we were promised wouldn't be in the season goes full villain mode and decides that they're going to kill an entire race as well as poison Earth in so doing it because he's just so grief-stricken, so in pain that he's willing to do that. Blinded. Blinded. Well, that was Book. He was blinded too. But I, I remember this. I didn't really have a strong feeling on it one way or another. I am honestly shocked that this is considered the best episode of the season. Not saying that we've had any before it that I would say was the obvious choice, but I don't think this is an obvious choice either. It is one where I go... What else is it going to be? I guess it's one with a fairly simple A-B story to it. It's... it, 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 It... it gives you the sensation that this entire season was worth something because now we have galaxy ending drama and it is one episode before the last. So, yeah. What did you think of uh, this Species 10C? Any, any strong reactions to this? I blocked my ears. I think. In the first watch and the rewatch, for multiple scenes of mm. this episode, there was see. I'm like, I just can't fucking do it because of what reason? Stupidity, mostly. Like, I really hate the general Undoya mm-hmm. shenanigans. She's... The, squ- the squat and scream, like I know that it gives us this beautiful title, yeah, and it is a poignant moment. I cried in their journeys. I cried, but I, I, I can't. Like it's too much for me to handle. Uh, so you weren't a fan of it. <laughs> no, no, I was not. <laughs> you had a physical reaction to want to retreat from it. Yes, yes, I did. <laughs> so. I was excited to see this after having just watched an episode that in this season I liked, and again, measuring on that uh, on that curve. And I was excited because this is, has been hyped up as the highest rated episode of the season, the only one that's cracked into a six in the ratings. All of them have been fives and a one point a four, and... I was looking forward to seeing a markup in quality, even if it was so, so minor. And my overall takeaway from this was not looking at it as the individual episode, but how it serves the overarching story of the season. Mm -hmm. And I was left with this question... And I and I, I ask this to to the writers on an individual level and as a team. How do you guys make Star Trek so gosh darn boring? <laughs> I kept on thinking that throughout it because I'm like, I, I would ask that. I used to ask that about landmark, Enterprise landmark things like they're discovering communication with a new species. Outside of our galaxy, and it's and it's boring. It's it's just listless. I don't even have that many complaints about the stupidity like we do with many other episodes in this series because everything was done in a manner that was. <sighs> A big sigh, and that's been season four overall. That's why I look at this in the in the grand scheme of season four. This is yet another puzzle piece that adds up to a picture that is just just one like big gray block 
There's no colors to this season. There's no shades. There's no highs and lows. It is all just this gray, miserable, listless, lifeless, energy, like energyless, bl- um, like amorphous blob of a show. Mm. Season three, for all of the things I hated about it, at least I had feelings about it. Like, I hated the burn. I loved to ridicule it. I loved how silly, like, I, 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 like, as much as I hated what they did to Saru as a character in that, in that season with them kicking him out of the captain's chair, at least I had an opinion on his character. I had an opinion on Michael. I had opinions on things. This is just. An episode that is emblematic of season four of Discovery, a season that even the fans don't talk about all that much. We're no. we're releasing this pretty much a year out from when this season was released, and people still talk about season three and season two and even season one of Star Trek Discovery, the fan base and just general like people who are so like understand Star Trek. No one talks about this. And if they do, they're very small in numbers. I am active look actively looking. I I look at the Star Trek Discovery Reddit. I'm on the Facebook groups. I'm on Twitter. I'm I'm talking to people in real life. And it's just like season four is just this thing where it's like, oh that happened. <laughs> Like, oh, there's not even that pathetic. much. The most vitriol I see from season four is the very ending of it, which affects some right wing American people. But for myself, I'm like, oh, cool. They got some lady that means something over there, but means jack shit to me down here. So I'm still not affected. I don't have an opinion. So that's my uh, relationship with Species 10C. It is a big shrug of my shoulders and I go, well, if uh, we don't do this, we never do this, but if I did not watch any of season four and we came in each episode just having read that plot summary that we have on IMDb and we just riffed criticisms, I don't think there would be that much of a difference. (laughs) I feel like because it's on autopilot, I feel like I could be on autopilot for my my reviews of this because there's nothing here. Uh, You had more of a reaction to it. So do you want to walk us through what uh, what that was coming from when it came to this? It's so contrived. And boilerplate, but oh so discovery at the same time, which makes it a recipe to infuriate me. Which plot do you want to start with? There were plots. There's the stuff happening on Bookship. And the stuff happening on Discovery, very you, similar. You 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 summed it up really well. Stuff. <laughs> it's just stuff. It's just well because yeah. because it's like okay, let's talk about what's happening on Discovery. They stand in a cargo bay, and slowly, and very awkwardly, break down how to talk to the Ten C. And then, meanwhile, on Book's ship. They build the groundwork so that they can fuck up the communication with the 10C and then leave us with a cliffhanger ending that will kick us off in excitement for the next episode. That's the stuff. Mm -hmm. Very little character-driven moments, very little touching on overall themes. And if they are touched, they are touched in the way that I am right now where I just acknowledge their existence and then we say, go on. Say the word. Oh, say the, the word or just acknowledge that we have a theme rather than giving the audience anything from that. It, it, it is peace. We've got to give it a chance. Diplomacy may work. Diplomacy may work. Fear. Don't give in to it. Pain can blind you. 
Find your center. Now, I just said all of those things. Now, you people listening out there, those are themes. And I just said them very matter of factly. Now, experience me doing that for 45 minutes straight. And tell me honestly if me stating those like that gained anything for you. Did you gain anything from that? And the answer is no. You will just be saying, well, I gained <laughs> like those themes. I know what they are, but you don't feel them. You don't, you don't engage with them. And that is one of the big, big, big problems of this for me is I don't even need the plot, the plot to be more jam packed or anything. It's make these, make these themes and character moments more defined, uh, have layers to them, have definition and wrinkles and make something matter, make it have, yeah, make it matter and make it real or heightened. Instead, it is just a bunch of people standing around talking. We need to mirror the light pattern back to them. How will that move us forward? It'll show them we recognize this as an effort to communicate. From there, we'll need to find a way to convey simple and then more complex thoughts. Sounds like the start of a frighteningly long process. Could be. Let's go to the book stuff, I guess, because if if you had to ask me which one was the one I liked watching more, I guess it's that, because it was three characters, and I know each one of them, and I know each one of them well enough to know that they were acting within character. Yeah. And so I'll praise the show for that. <laughs> I'll praise the show for that. So we have Tignatara has been captured. Book and Taka are working out how to uh, get out and get back at the Ten C, and they have communications with the United Earth General Lady. She's feeding them stuff that will be beneficial to them coming up with a plan, and Taka finds uh, an equation or theory or something or other that, you know, science mumbo-jumbo, and he's going to blow up the entire galaxy. Yeah. And, uh, okay, I'm being... <laughs> I'm being very offhanded about it, but there is more to this stuff here. There is there is an avenue to uh, uh, discuss things. So, how about you you kick us off with uh, Tignataro with Jet Reno, because she's our gateway into this. She's our audience surrogate character. She's the one we're rooting for, and she's the one observing the things unfold. Yeah, that she is, and she really wants some licorice. Yeah, oh, I relate. I don't actually. I hate black licorice. Uh, it's, it's foul. You don't even like hey, any other kind of licorice. Hey, is it good to know that licorice makes it? Crosswords don't. Compasses don't. But zip ties and black licorice make it all the way into the future. How do you yeah. feel? Does that feel realistic to you? I, I I feel satisfied. I feel like a compass would outlive licorice, but maybe maybe I'm just silly. I'm just a little goofball. Do you think Skittles are still there? Yeah, yeah, I do. Do you think the Skittle company is still existing? Oh, no, I just feel like the somebody one... would have programmed it into a replicate, replicator at some point. Yeah, so so uh, Tig's here. Tig is here, confirmed. She 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 showed up for a paycheck. Uh, uh, Cronenberg, Cronenberg tapped her on the shoulder and said, "You're in now to collect your paycheck and do it very apathetically." Yeah. So, uh, tell us a bit about Jet Reno. Um, she's just stuck at the back of their bridge, <laughs> just with random boxes, and. Oh, oh my god, I don't know if I can fucking do this, Ryan. I don't know if I can. Why? This took up roughly 20 minutes of the episode. So there must be things to get into. She's sitting next to some boxes eating black licorice and sticking it in her com badge. Because when it breaks down, it conducts the electricity so that 
She can send a message, but she can't send the message until she gets books, com cards. Mm. And she, while doing all of this, is trying to get book to see reason. She is see that Tark is crazy. Not just that, but to understand the gravity of what he is doing and how he is hurting those walk who it actually back. Yes, walk it back. Walk it back, and she's trying to relate to him. She tells a story about how when her wife died and she was left on that ship that was stuck in that area in season two, and. You know, they found her way back when we met her. Way back when we met her, and the Red Angel incident happened. And we never did find out how they knew to find Tig, by the way. Just still, no one answered that question for me. In season two, I asked a whole lot of questions, but the one I kept asking was how in the time travel loop stuff did they even know to find Tig? But not just they need no they, they needed a specific engineer, but how did they know where Tig was to find when Tig was lost in space? Somebody answer that for me. Nope, no answers. But when she was on that ship, what incident happened? What was the moment that she had that helped uh, humanize her, humble her, and make her relate to Book? Well, no. It it doesn't actually do those things. Well, it's supposed to. It's supposed to. Important distinction. Um, a young man wanted to die, but she elongated his life. Horribly burnt. Hor- he was horribly burnt. She kept on replicating skin grafts, and they didn't work. She kept him alive for 11 days, and then when... He died. She looked at his eyes and goes, Oh, they're green like my wife, like my poor dead wife. Whose name is? Does anyone know? Does anyone know? Nobody, Nobody knows. present at this recording. Knows. Nobody knows. No human on the planet Earth listening knows the name of... Of Tignataro's wife in this show. Chet Reno's wife. I remember her name. <laughs> Can we not bother calling her Jet Reno? She's just Tignataro. She's yeah. not acting. She can't act for a start. She can only be Jet Reno, and Jet Reno is Tig, so they're one in the same. She's Shatner, honestly, where Shatner's Kirk. So I didn't mind that story as much as we're making fun of it. Uh... I felt that it was great to have a moment where a character tells a story from their past that is tying into the matters at hand, matters in hand right now, and helping the character that they're relaying this to have a revelation and or uh, uh, awaken to something. It's textbook. This is what you do in 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 writing in television shows. No one actually speaks like this in real life. I don't speak like this. When Rachel, Rachel, you're having a hard day, I don't just sit you down and go, all right, Rachel. You see, one time when I was a 16-year-old boy living in... Yeah, I don't do that. Nobody does that. (laughs) No, no. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, we use stories to help communicate points to one another, but nobody does it the way that they do in shows. We have to accept that suspension of disbelief that TV show characters don't speak like real people, especially if they're in a grand sci-fi setting. That's in a, in a related note, this episode was really bad in terms of noticing the blocking of people because of COVID. Oh yeah, like the most of the time they weren't. Of- most of the time they weren't there for one. Yeah. The separation of people and, like, you're like, oh, well, this is a composite shot, isn't it? Yeah, and I saw the outlines or the irritation marks of the masks that they were wearing right before they did the take on a few actors. I mean, this is not the series' fault. This is just how production had to be done because of the... the It's a product of the times, but it will forever mark this show of when it was made. 
as well as other things like when they said uh, Elon Musk was this genius superhuman of Earth. <laughs> yeah, that's one. That one's aged real well since you put that there, guys. That one, I really love that. Uh, ooh, ooh, you guys, you gonna take that one back, Seas? No, those riders are gone now. I actually rather enjoyed. And I saw this more present in the Taka side of things, but it was in the other moments too, that the characters spoke consistently to their characters rather than as just one entity of the writers, which is been which has been very much the case during season four, where I would say if Michael's speech was given to Book, or if Book's speech was given to Detmer, or if Detmer's speech was given to Owo, or if Tilly's speech was given to Adira, there would be no real need to change anything in the dialogue, let alone the rhythm of it and the messaging of it. And I, I actually rather want to praise in this episode when Saru was talking and motivating. It felt like what Saru would say, specifically him or Tare- President Tarina, who is a recurring guest spot character. And the fact that I can confidently say that she spoke like how she would in this series says a lot. And same with Taka, he's a one season character, and we understand who he is, not just because of the performance, but there has been a consistency in the writing for how he gets uh his message across, yeah. how he how he talks, his vernacular, the way he uh lies has mm-hmm. been crafted where when he was presenting himself in the way he was in this i never shook my head and said that's dishonest i mean he was being dishonest as a character but i was not shaking my head going they as writers are being dishonest uh the book side of things of course he gets betrayed by taka because taka's a villain that we'll promise we wouldn't have but here he is being villainous and I like that talk is just a a weasley piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. The actor and The actor is good at the it. The actor is good at it and I'm rooting for him to destroy an entire race of people because I fucking know what he wants, you know? Like I know what he wants and it's beyond just I want things to be good. Because that's all our main characters want really is I just want things to be good. I want to save the day. I don't know, man. I I guess I'm rooting for a guy who just is willing to kill everyone so that he can go to another universe and hopefully meet up with his boyfriend and have a happy life uh, with no regrets because he's incapable of that. But that in itself says a lot. Like, can you live a happy life if you're incapable of feeling emotions because you're a psychopath? (laughs) Uh, Like, can Tarka ever achieve? this dream he's chasing when the means to do so proves that he's unable to do that because... Yeah, the the journey indicates no. Your friend Tarka's going to kill us all. What are you talking about? I saw his calculations. If he pulls the power source while the DMA's up and running, the hyperfield will implode, destroying everything and anyone inside of it. He said it'll be safe. He lied. We get an answer for why he's Cleveland Booker. Oh, oh, that was something they've been setting up for two seasons now. And I asked last season, is this a mystery that's worth two seasons of build-up? People? Uh, Was it? The answer was, he was just some guy who came from a lineage of people. Dread Pirate Roberts. It's just Dread Pirate Roberts, but boring. Again, boring, boring, boring. And they made it seem like it was going to be a big reveal. Like, I joked, like, wouldn't it be funny if it was Prime Lorca for some reason? Because that would be goofy. Or if it was like, and it's Geordie LaForge or something weird. And the reveal is, it was just some bloke. Why did this have to be a thing held over two seasons? It is really as if I said in season one, at the very beginning, guys, we're doing this podcast called Yum Yum. Now, you may think it's because Commander Nandi and Star Trek Discovery said yum yum, but I actually have a different reason for why we called it yum yum, something that's very personal to me. And I 
I don't want to tell you right now, but please, please know that when I do, it will really give you a different viewpoint on why we called it Yum Yum. And then we cut to now and I just go, oh, I just called it Yum Yum because I thought it was funny. Oh, yeah, obviously. Thank you, dude. Wasn't worth all that build up. Like, you're getting frustrated that I did this whole elaborate thing where I just talked there for like 30 seconds. That's his show, but imagine it for two literal years of your life. I don't have to. You don't have to. I am not interested now in talking about the actual material of the plot because it just is. I wish there was more stupid things in it. I wish there was more audacious things in it, like baby bones and them rubbing it or those snip, uh, those snippy back and forth dialogue between characters or overtly dumb stuff like yum yum or AI sausage because at least those would be something to analyze and look at and go, why would they do that? I actually long for the days where we had absurd things like Giorgio saying orange, really? And then we had to figure out what that meant because nothing was orange. And then you figured out that it was some production design thing that didn't line up. Like originally it was supposed to be an orangey red paint on the bridge, but they just used red, but they kept it in the script anyway. So it didn't make sense. Here it is just, yeah. They try to talk to the Tennessee in a language that is a little different to what we usually see in science fiction shows of this variety, which is cool and it, which is neat in itself. I'm I'm not against that, but they figure it out and uh, then it's interrupted because we have a season long mystery and a season long uh, uh, problem to solve, and so we have to raise those stakes again and deal with them next time on Star Trek Discovery. Discovery. Mm-hmm. What, f- what for you would you summarize as the thing about this episode that makes it so repellent in terms of details and wanting to talk about it? Because with each one of these episodes in season four, there has been that thing, that element, whether it's a structure or or the focus, or the writing in this angle, in this degree, what would you say is the thing for you that makes it a failure? There's just nothing interesting to it in its execution. Even though there are things that they're trying to do, it just leaves me with nothing. Like, There are a couple of shots where they're trying to do something interesting, like when things are spiraling out of control around Michael. So they literally do that with the camera where she's standing still, but the background is spinning. And it's just like, oh, you had an idea. Yeah. I... Yeah, It's about that interest, isn't it? And I... (sighs) I don't know how to discuss this because it's such a, 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 I don't know, it's such a nebulous nebulous and and, and, and just the way of things today. We've watched a a lot of modern shows where they have their structure like this, whether it was Game of Thrones, Orange New Black, The Mandalorian, or or Star Treks currently, or or we can name a whole bunch of them. Serialized prestige television shows. The event shows. Even though I can say that there are many that I enjoyed, I flinch at the idea of reviewing them, or even discussing them episode by episode to break them down, because I think I, like many people, you watch them, You may even binge them, and you're enjoying the episodes as you are consuming them, but you're doing it so that you can get to the next one. Yeah. And then you can get to the next one until you reach the conclusion, and then you can look back on all of it and decide whether it was a fulfillment or not. Game of Thrones is actually a wonderful example of this, where Game of Thrones was for... Six to seven years, 
a very much praised and beloved series. Every episode was analyzed, everyone celebrated, everyone talked about it, went over it with a fine tooth comb, but then the show failed in its ending. And since it failed in its ending, it made people really bitter about the whole entire show and it lost all of its cultural relevance as well yeah. as just people even talking about episodes anymore like no one talks about those individual episodes now they just talk about how they used to like it they like this character for this reason this scene this scene this moment maybe they did like this episode but no one is engaging with it like we do with the sopranos say or Mad Men, where people still bring up these episodes, these moments, these things, they engage with it. Because Game of Thrones, like Star Trek Discovery, is one where you're watching the episodes and you're really into it for whatever reason. Then you watch the next one and you watch the next one. It's also you can build to that satisfying conclusion. Mm. And without that satisfying conclusion, it becomes meaningless in a lot of ways. Yeah. And that Star Trek Discovery, especially this season, where I'm keenly aware that that's what this is designed to be. It is designed to be just all build up. It's all just build up, build up, build up until you get to the season finale where they blow the raspberry in your face and say, well, this is what we're going to set up for next season. See you next year. Bye. Bye. And I am sick of that. And I'm not even saying that I need episodic television either. There is a way to do these modern prestige shows where I don't feel like the individual episodes are just a thing that exists so that we can get to that final end game. I think there are examples within modern television where you can have those individual episodes where they are an actual thing that you can get something from. It's one of the reasons why I would love to uh, one day look over The Expanse as a series because I bounced off of that early on because I felt this very problem. But I've been told it changes and it goes other directions, but I don't know if that's true or not because I just didn't feel that. Here, I, I we've gone with Discovery because it's Star Trek. It's a thing we know. So... We just have kept watching it because, well, it's Star Trek. It's a thing we know. But the style of television that this is aping off of is not actually a style we particularly, like, watch a lot of. Like, a lot of the modern shows we we do watch, we go, oh, well, this is a bit popular, and we decide if we're going to give it a go or not. And even then, we don't give that many of them a go we we look for what we particularly enjoy and a lot of it is deep character stuff like your better call souls or your breaking bads where those again great individual episodes not every single episode just feels like oh this is this is just watching them build the foundation to then give us the finale yeah how do you feel uh, about that? Just let, 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 Let's let just dive into that a bit of television and the way that serialized stuff go. Do you have that, that what I'm going over, do you have that exhaustion or that perspective or, or not? And does it apply with Star Trek Discovery at all? Well, yeah, because it... <sighs> Assuming your interest and it takes your viewership for granted a lot because it's like, we'll make it better next time. We'll make it better next time. Next season will be more interesting. Mm. We're going to pay it off bigger and better every single time. That's the implicit or explicit promise of the season of Star Trek Discovery. And it's like, no, 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 we're different this time. There's no villain this season. Mm. And what's Tarka? And what's Tarka? I I feel like there are so many shows on currently that are acclaimed, and I see the responses of people being very joyous and in love and overwhelmed by 
This week's episode of Andor was the best thing I've ever seen in my life. And blah, blah, blah. It's the sensationalism. Yeah, and the that mentality of like, yeah, man, I love Species 10C. It's the best episode of this season of Star Trek Discovery. Did you see the rating on IMDb? It says so. How's it really any different to anything else we've seen this season? And that's how I feel with so many shows where I go, how's this really any different? I think of... um. Another example, and this isn't a series that I even hate, I actually rather enjoyed it, was, uh, what was that time loop show, Russian Doll? Yeah. Russian Doll, where it's it's a Groundhog Day thing, so mm-hmm. a part of the DNA of it is that repetition. Yeah. But I could not tell you why this episode of Russian Doll was better than that episode of Russian Doll. There's a reason why. Yeah, there's a reason why we didn't watch the new season because I I gave it a go like we gave it a brief look over and went eh yeah I I don't know like there were just a, a glut of these and it's not just because old television did it like this new TV does it like this as well like they can do it serialized shows can do it like Better Call Saul I can tell you which episodes in season six of Better Call Saul were the really great ones and why they stood out more than this episode and that episode. I can tell you that, and how it still works in a serialized format, but I feel this homogenous and like a thing with with television shows of of this ilk, and that's why it's hard to even talk about species ten C as an episode. Is it the best episode of season four? I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you. No, no, neither can I. Is it the worst? I don't know. I, uh, I I wouldn't say that. I I don't think it's the worst, but in some ways it is because it is making me the most apathetic. I guess. Yet the first episode made you the most apathetic, and you don't even remember it. Well, I don't remember this. Uh, yeah, we finished watching it like less than an hour ago, maybe. Yeah, I. And it's just. Not in my brain anymore. Remember when we were... I think it was after we watched this episode for the first time. And you were like, Ah, they gave us an answer to something. And I'm like, what? And you were like, book his name? And I was like, they did that? Yeah. Two seasons of build-up. Like, I missed... That the point of that conversation entirely. <laughs> Everybody does. Nobody cares. Uh, I. There is just this attitude with Star Trek Discovery that I see with, like I'm saying, so many pieces of media, wheel spinning. And they think, oh, if I just crank the wheel harder and faster, that means the wheels don't look like they're just spinning. It's still the same shit, man. Like, I just... (laughs) Like, this is just wheel spinning. This is just... Look at it go round and round and round and round. But now they're just doing it harder and faster and it makes it look like there's more to it, but really not. So, the summary of this episode is that um, the members of Discovery's team figure out how to speak to the 10C. Mm -hmm. And Taka escapes the orb, Mm -hmm. which aggravates the 10C. Yeah. That sounds like two scenes, not two plots of an episode. And yeah, and I could also throw back at you, why is this a 12 episode season? Could this not be six? Could this not be two? Could this not be 40? Like, <sighs> why? Like, what makes this worthy of the number of hours that is made to watch it? There are shows. Let alone. The hours that went into making it. Yeah. There are shows where they have a specific amount of episodes that you are allotted. 
Yes, you have eight, you have six, you have 12, 15, 22. 24, whatever 24. It is. And some shows prove that they did not deserve it, and others show us that this was the right amount, or even, you know, they needed more, and that makes you hungry for more. I, I mean, Twin Peaks Season 1 has eight episodes, if I'm not mistaken. Perfect. Didn't need any more. You didn't need less. It was just sweet, mm-hmm. just right. And then you got season that little t- extra with the length of the pilot. Yep. And then you get season two, mm-hmm. and they get like the twenty-two season long episode, and you go, nope, 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 nope. And it's not even because they were forced to reveal the killer of Laura Palmer early on. It just. That was not a show that that deserved that many a season because there was an event nature of it. And since Discovery is an event show, each season is like an anthology season. Why is it 12 hours? Why is it not a lean six hours? British and Australian television since the very beginning, has proven that you can do this in that amount of time. There's no need other than we must. I lean into the mystery of what's coming next. I'm someone who doesn't like to know from, from Michelle Paradise and Alex and all the other writers. I don't want them to tell me what's coming because in life you don't know what's coming. You can have plans and then the things can happen. So I really love the, also the, the chance to over the course of all these seasons not know and then discover what are the next things and then just lean into it and lean into it and lean into it and let it take me where it's going to go. Could you get up on your phone? Oh, Could you get up on your phone? who the writers of Species 10C were. Because uh, this is something that You want to put them on blast? No. No, no. I just want to know. Because I know that when we talk about Star Trek, the original series, the TNG era, Voyager, Deep Space Nine, and so on, we, we go, oh... I like these ideas, or I like these recurring things, and many, many times, we can actually pinpoint which writers bring those things to the table. Like, Brandon Braga, for all of his faults that he does for 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 Voyager and Enterprise, he has specific things he liked to do, and they would actually be utilized very well when he was on TNG. For Michael Pillar, I could tell you what his interests were and what he did to aid the series and what his voice was. Same with, and I could go on, DC Fontana, Gene Roddenberry himself, uh, uh, David Gerald, right? I could, I, the fact that I can list you their names says so much about how even though they worked in a very strict framework, we know this about TNG, yeah, where TNG had a very hard time because of because of Gene Roddenberry's strict mm-hmm. adherence to the vision, as well as Rick's own ver- Rick Burns' own version of that for, say, Voyager. And yet, there were those writers who had their specific interests, their specific things that they offered to the table that still would gel within the very, very tightly woven uh, brand that is Star Trek. And yet... Who are these writers? Well, it's the same writer as the examples. Yeah, tell me. Tell me. Who, is it just one writer? Uh, yeah, one really one, like more listed because it's like Gene Rottenberry because mm. it's based on. Characters, yes. Um, Brian Fuller and Alex Kurtzman because it's created by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you have two story editors. Yeah, still not the, the writer. Oh. Uh, one written by, and then a staff writer that's also associated. Okay, let's get the written by. Who is it? Kyle Jarrow. Okay. Star Trek Discovery fans, and I mean this, I know that you're not listening, because <laughs> we've been nothing but mean to this episode, as well as season four, but I, I, I want a call out. Tell me what this guy's interests are as a writer. Oh. And tell me... Tell me how those are shown in Star Trek Discovery. Tell me that. 
And don't give me, well, in modern writing of television shows, there's a far more unified vision. And the showrunner of Alex Kurtzman has such a, don't give me that. Don't you fucking give me that. Because I've also seen shows like, again, Better Call Saul. I could tell you when Vince Gilligan wrote an episode. He didn't write Mm -hmm. that many for Better Call Saul, but I could tell you which ones he did. And I could tell you which ones he directed as well. You felt his voice. You felt his voice. You felt his influence. Yet it was still on brand for what that series was. I could tell you which ones were written by which people because you could just get that feel for it. Even though that series has a very specific tone that it adheres to, it stays true to its themes very strictly, yet you could still hear those voices coming from that staff of writers. Here, who is this guy? Who is he? What's he interested in? And how did he give us this in Species 10C? And I, um, I don't know. I I don't know. I don't know. But I've, I've taken a look at his credits. And I also want to figure out whether this is the outlier in his career. Or another project that he did is because, so you're, are you familiar at all with the idea of a book in a musical? What do you mean by that? Sorry, you threw me off with, are you familiar with the idea of a book? And I'm like, I do know what a book is. (laughs) I got told about what book is in this episode, in fact. It's a lineage. It's a Dread, yeah, Dread Pirate Roberts thing. He's the fifth. He's book the fifth. fifth. He's book the fifth. No. No, no. So, <laughs> so explain yourself. Sorry, you've thrown me. Uh, it, my basic understanding is the book is sort of the story of the musical. Mm-hmm. The the narrative structure that then that, that the, you frame li- the, you, the the you, lyrics and the songs the songs hang are off composed of. off. Yeah, and he wrote the book for a particular musical. Oh no! Is that what? Oh no! Was it a good one? I haven't seen it. Okay, that doesn't answer it. So, what is it? Is it the SpongeBob musical live on stage? <sighs> no, 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 no! I just want to say too, I do not want to judge writers for where they came from like that because many of the writers that we love from these science fiction shows. Came from strange places. This was his fifth project. JMS, creator of Babylon 5, worked on He-Man, She-Ra, kids shows, right? The real Ghostbusters. So I don't want to judge the these people for, oh, you know, he worked on a musical for SpongeBob. That doesn't matter. Tell me now, though, that he's in this series, what he does. Or any of them. Is there anyone that actually has a voice. Because that was what we liked about the idea of Brian Fuller coming in to do Star Trek Discovery in the early days. Because Brian Fuller has a very distinct vision. And you may like it, you may hate it, but you cannot deny that he does. And when he helms a show, he gets writers that also have very stark vision. Hence, the first two seasons had that very stark vision because he did bring his uh, Pushing Daisies writers along and they became the showrunners who were those toxic people that got kicked off. But they did have a thing. It was messy, it was sloppy, but in those early days of Star Trek Discovery, I could kind of gather what those people were fascinated by and what they wanted to explore. Here, Species 10C, Mm-hmm. It's well, those talking points, connection, family, don't fear fear, embrace love. Like We could go on and would on. Would you like to know about his first project? Who? I can't even tell you his name again. Kyle. Kyle. Kyle, what was his first project? His first project was back in 2010. Small indie film. It's described as an off-kilter Comedy. It's called Armless. What do you think this film's about, Ryan? A guy with no arms? No. A woman with no arms. 
No. A dog with no arms. No. A sponge bob with no arms. No. I have no arms, but I must scream. A woman comes to terms with her husband's strange secret. Ah. A compulsive desire to cut off his arms. That sounds interesting. I've watched that. That sounds fun. Oh, then that's, an, that's something that's actually yeah. rather, uh, that sparked me. Body horror stuff, right? David Cronenberg is an actor within this series. He has the phrase Cronenbergian because he has a fucking voice, dude. You know what his interests are. You know his style. Yeah, he's a filmmaker. But he is in the embodiment of the issue that I have with Discovery. I don't know. They're all just working. It's like when you look at the Star Trek Picard writers for season two, and a bunch of them are interns. Fresh interns that were just handed the legacy series. Like, I would be fucking furious if I was a well-known science fiction writer. You know, I I, I would have been fucking furious about that, and I would be... I'm, I'm just as a fan furious, but... That's it. Species 10C. Oh, Huda. Um, he showed up. You don't want to know about the staff rider? That was... No, not really. My point has been made, which is these are just names that will be changed in a year's time and changed again and changed yeah. again until the show ends. They are just a an army of people that you hire to put words on the page. That is all. There is no soul behind any of it. Huda, the part of the show where we look at Dr. Hugh Colbert, he was here. He was here. He smiled and nodded, if I'm not mistaken. He did do some other things, though. He was helping out Zora, playing a game with her, immediately found something underneath the floor. Don't forget the important scene where... Where, where Paul says to him, really out of nowhere, are you okay? Do you need help? And it gave him a little moment to, to remind us about how he's still struggling and that the last episode we watched was important because he's still thinking about those baby bones and how they made him feel things that he hasn't felt since before he died. <laughs> and that's reminding us that that thing happened too. Oh. It's all important. It's call, It's what we call continuity and since they mentioned it that means it's good that yeah, means it's good continuity up with it they stamets well, well some of it they keep told up with, yeah. paul paul told you you that they're gonna go on holiday when this all is over and i'm sure we'll see that right and we'll get a meaningful uh moment between the two i'm sure that'll happen yeah and we'll see it Sure, sure, right, sure, 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 but sure, sure. Hugh does find the badge uh, for Tignataro that they left behind, and that is Hugh's. You actually joked. Do you want to? You want to explain to the yumlings out there what happened when you saw this? So Hugh's in the engineering thing. He's just standing there talking to Adira, and then he does something. He just picks up a gray off the. F- Mm-mm. You joked about how. Why is you now walking off over here, <laughs> speaking to Adira without facing them? And then I said, <laughs> well, to do this thing, which is he starts walking and then he turns his head and notices the badge underneath yeah, and then he bends wasn't, down. That wasn't what I was referring no, no, to. No, no, you weren't referring to that, but the show answered why it was doing <laughs> no, that. Yes. You were referring to, like, why is he now walking and talking like this? No, and the no, show's no. like, ah. No, no, no. It's this. No, no, no. That wasn't. It. Um, so everybody is teleporting around everywhere this episode. They're using those personal transporters like nobody's fucking business. I would love an episode where somebody accidentally transported onto another person and then they died, and then we have to like have a whole ethical dilemma about Guest personal transporters. David Cronenberg. No, he won't direct. <laughs> Uh, oh no, 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 no. He ain't wasting his fucking technical skills. He he will he'll, he'll sit there mm. and not take his fucking glasses off and you'll pay him for it, bitch. 
but uh, he ain't going to direct. Jesus, I'd love if John Carpenter directed uh, an episode because no, he doesn't no, give a so, fuck. But Hugh is investigating this problem with the sentient computer aboard the ship, and he walks so that realistically the scene where he gets to engineering doesn't have to happen right away. Because that piece of information needs to come after these scenes with Michael and these scenes with Book. So he walks. Because if he didn't walk, if he transported, like almost every other fucking person does in this episode, they immediately would have found Reno's badge, they immediately would have found the thing, and it wouldn't have coincided with Taka doing the plasma burn. You said all that, and you will have an answer, I'm sure, because I'm sure the show had an answer. Why was Hugh in engineering? Why was he going there? Why was the doctor going there? Because he was helping... Zora, yeah, yeah, try yeah. and figure it out. And why? Well, no, no, no. Why did he have to do that? No, because he's the counselor. So yeah. he was helping Zora, and they were like, "Oh, this thing happened with Rena around the same time. If we can find her, maybe we can find some answers." And the ship's recording thingies were saying. That Reno was in engineering. Okay, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, Hugh yeah, goes but... down there, talks to Adira, and then Adira is just like, "I haven't seen her all day." You're giving me the mechanics of it, and I appreciate that. That's what I knew you would do. But why is this not just Paul, who's in an engine, who's engineering, has a relationship with Tig Dataro in the series? Because it's not about Tig. It's not. A, they haven't realized and that it's Tig's not about, going messy. Uh, and it's not about Paul. It's not about Paul. It's, it's about, not about Hugh either, but it it's is. It's about Zora. Is it? Zora has the problem. Hugh, as a counselor, is trying to help her resolve this problem. Yeah, but it's that thing of Zora's not a fucking character, really. No! So it's, th- th- that's why I'm breaking it down like this, because when he walked in engineering, my first response was, why are you here? There's no medical emergency here. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. that should not be my thought process, but I only see him through that lens. And your explanation, technical, mechanical, accurate, yet... I don't believe in it. <laughs> like, I know that's why it's there, but my brain just goes, this should just be Paul doing this scene. Why isn't it Paul? And it made me go, where is Paul? And then I realized, has he even been in the episode? Remember? And then he showed up and I'm like, oh, that's right. He has been here. And Remember at the top when you were like, these characters feel like they're true to themselves. They do when they're talking, but this was one of those action <laughs> things where it's like, why is it Paul? Why isn't it Paul? Why is why it Hugh? Is it, why, why is it Hugh? Cause, cause I can Hugh, understand why Hugh's it's Adira the there too. And here's another thing. Why isn't... Okay. <laughs> Answer me this though. Why is it Hugh that finds the badge? What is the reason for the writers to make it Hugh and not say... Adira, who was... Because Adira finds the other thing. Okay. Okay. There you go. Because Adira does another (laughs) MacGuffin find. Yes! Really reminds me of Rise of Skywalker, where it's like, why must they find this knife? Well, you see, if they find this knife, it leads them to this thing. And then, well, why do they have to go to that thing? Well, Ryan, obviously, if they go to the ruins of the Death Star and hold up the knife at a certain angle, it will lead them into find the Wayfinder. Well, why do they need to find the Wayfinder? Well, Ryan, they need to find the Wayfinder because, and on it goes, that's you. We already went off of talking about his character because there is no character in this episode. He's a he's a thing that walks around and perpetuates the plot. That is all he does. He may have some The next episode. Wait, episode wait. What do you 13. give it? What, what do you give this? A yum being bad or yum yum being good? This is the highest rated episode of season 4. 
Well, I guess it has to be a yum yum then, right? Yum yum. Wow, Rachel was not going to give any episodes this season a yum <laughs> yum, but here joking. we are. What? It's a yum. Yum. I give this a yum. Yum. Not at all unexpected. And I want to know, now that we have got to this point, why do you think this is the highest rated episode of the season? What, what do you think? Because it's the most Star Trek in the idea. Is it? The idea of making first contact and having to learn and understand a language that is completely foreign. Mm. That idea is very Star trek in a lot of different ways. Okay. I think that, well, let's take a look at the reviews if you want to know. No, I agree. There's no need to look at the reviews. I agree with you. I think that people look at this more favorably because it ticks the certain boxes premise-wise and plot-wise of what we come to the series for rather than the actual contents within it. You hear they make contact with this newfound alien race and they have to do it in this way. And we go over the way where it's like they have to figure out, use maths and that there's compassion between and it's this unfurling of... It sounds very Star Trek. But you watch it and what you really get is, yeah, you get that, but you also get this... This little little secret plot where the, the general from Earth is going to stay on Discovery so that they can feed Book the secret information. But Book's been taken out by Tarker and Tarker's given the general this information so that they can sabotage the ship so that they can go fly off and kill a whole species. And, da, 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 da. and that is what takes up the time mm-hmm. rather than that premise that would draw in the Star Trek people, but since that premise exists, it gets a higher rating. What's next episode? What is the season finale of Star Trek Discovery Season 4? Coming home. Episode 13 of Season 4 of Star Trek Discovery. As the DMA approaches Earth and Navarre, and with evacuations underway, Burnham and the team aboard the USS Discovery must find a way to communicate and connect with a species far different from their own before time runs out. I have a feeling it'll all work out. It'll all work out in the end. I have a feeling it'll be A-OK. So that is they it. They meet the president of We Earth. are done and dusted. You can contact us on social media under Yum Yum Pod or Yum Yum Podcast. Our email address is yumyumpod at gmail.com in case you want to let us know your thoughts and opinions on things that we've discussed on the podcast or you just want to reach out. All of this is in the description of the episode as you can find it below. And you can support the podcast on Patreon. That's right, Patreon, where we have so much stuff there that you will be fed for a lifetime. So if you have the means to do so, go over to Yum Yum Podcast on Patreon. Rate and review the podcast as well. If you have not done that, you have let me down, you have let Rachel down, and you have let species 10c down and you know what happens if you let those guys down they do some farts they just do some little toots from their boot uh and uh that is it i am done and dusted can't wait for commander nandi to come back next week she'll be there right she'll show up she'll be there to save the day i'm sure she has an opinion to offer they don't need to murder this antagonist though he gets killed? Taka does, but the Ten C. They're not antagonists. They're just a being that exists. Yeah, but He's an antagonist. He kills himself. He, well, he may have survived. He may have gone to the other galaxy. I'm sure him and the Prime Lorca can have long conversations about being meaningful to the series at large. <laughs>